Coming up on Omnivore, a fresh look at food service menus, a conversation with the USDA's nutrition chief, plus eliminating pathogens with ultraviolet light. All that and more. It's episode two of Omnivore from the editors of Food Technology Magazine and the Institute of Food Technologists. This episode of Omnivore is brought to you by IFT's new concierge membership. Accelerate your product development and innovate faster with the concierge membership. Find out more at www.ift.org slash membership. Welcome to Omnivore, the new podcast from IFT and Food Technology Magazine, where we explore the intersection of business, science, and technology in the global food system. I'm Bill McDowell. The COVID-19 pandemic was devastating for many food service and restaurant companies. But the sector has largely bounced back by embracing off-premise dining, digital technology, and menu innovation. Despite labor, inflation, and supply chain issues, five of the top 10 restaurant chains posted double-digit growth last year. Food Technologies Executive Editor Mary Ellen Kuhn recently chatted with contributing editor and consumer trends guru Elizabeth Sloan about how food service continues to evolve for a post-COVID world. Liz, coming out of the pandemic, what are the biggest changes you see in the food service landscape? And are these changes permanent? You know, I think there's really three. And one, the first one, of course, is spoken about a lot, but there, uh, there's definitely a greater emphasis on off-premise dining. It's been verified now throughout the pandemic that it does build incremental and sustainable sales. And so I think it's going to stay. So you see it's particularly important for restaurants that are not quick service. Off-premises is about 75% of, of sales in quick service. The interesting thing is the pandemic has let it move into more traditional restaurants. So for example, right now in the, in the past year, uh, Applebee's, for example, has, has had a quarter of its income coming from off-premises sales. The Olive Garden, which you always think is a sit-down restaurant, 25% of sales. And Texas Roadhouse is even higher and, and, and other chains like Shake Shack, which are, these are all some of the fastest growing restaurants in the past year. So I think it's definitely going to stay. It's going to broaden beyond QSR and um, it's going to be very, very interesting. We'll talk about that a little later. The second is I think that as a result, maybe, there's a new unique demand to really upgrade in restaurant dining. People are looking for more exciting items. They're getting more exciting things from takeout or in the supermarket. They're looking for more of an experience when they go there. And that's why we're seeing, among other things, just going back to restaurants, this movement to go back to fine dining preferentially, uh, even for a limited occasion, right? Or casual restaurants just to um, have a different kind of meal, a more, a more desirable experience, let's say. And then the third one is kind of unusual because I don't ever remember this one before. And that's some of the, um, the co-opting that we're seeing uh, between different restaurant chains and even restaurants and, and consumer retail products that we've never seen before. So, for example, uh, post-pandemic, we see a lot of the restaurant groups that own several restaurant chains have been putting them together under one roof. Can you imagine you can go in and you have Cinnabon, Carvel, ice cream, and Schlotzky's Deli all in one place. It'd be like a dream come true. Uh, Do you want to talk about off-premises a little more and how critical that is for restaurant chains to cultivate? Yeah, I I think what's interesting here on the off-premises is you see this in this massive restaurant industry moving in to focus on off-premise. And this idea of everyone wants their food uh, faster and more easily is a good one. But the question is, to what extreme should they be going? And I you know, just started to sit down and think about what, what's going on here. Now we have the double drive throughs that are being tested all over the country, um, where one lane is, is traditional. You can go in and order 
and then they'll place your order and you just wait and you go out with it. The other one is digital only or mobile phone only. And so you pre-order basically, and then you speed right through. And just about every major firm you can think of has done that. And of course, the most, uh, probably the most famous one is Taco Bell with their, it's called their Defy prototype, where they have four lanes downstairs and upstairs is the kitchen and your food orders, three of them are digital only comes through in a little waiter, a dumb waiter that comes down. It's kind of interesting. But I think the problem here is, are they going too far too fast? Because so many of these uh, restaurant chains are putting up, I call them boxes, and they have a, a two drive through lanes. They don't have a sit down area. Chipotle has started of uh, Chipotle kitchens where there's no place for anybody to sit down. It's just prepared and you pick it up or Panera to go like in Chicago, where it's only for delivery people or you going in and picking up an order. Chili's is doing the same thing, particularly near college campuses. What's happening is they, they seem to be forgetting that people like to go into the restaurant, particularly at certain times of day. This gorgeous Defy model of Taco Bell has just recently announced that in their second iteration, they are putting the dining room back in. Well, what should science of food product developers be focusing on to support the food service sector? I think here there's, there's three things that are really, really important and sort of age old in a lot of ways. First is with all this off-premise and takeout going on is no matter how much they've done it in the past, it still needs better packaging. And the, it's interesting because the National Restaurant Association surveys chefs in the United States every year for the, for the national culinary trends for the upcoming year. And this is the first time ever that in the top three, they were not food. Each one is, shows you how important this product, a problem is. Packaging to maintain temperature when you take something out of a restaurant and packaging to keep the food intact so it doesn't move around. And they cite specifically things like salads and beverages and soups to have better packaging to not only keep the food intact, but to be, I guess, more attractive. You pay $10 for a margarita and somebody develop, delivers it and it's in a plastic cup. So maybe there's two sides of this functionality, but also uh, you know, just the visual component of it. So I think that's number one. Number two, if you look back at what are the operators saying are their major problems uh, going through this pandemic, what, one of the things they come out with is the problem with labor and the back of the house, meaning in the kitchen. And the number one issue they cite is lack of qualified chefs, sous chefs, cooks, um, preparation people. And so as an industry, that's a golden opportunity for food technologists and food developers. And lastly, just innovation. Where is the innovation? Where's the next chalupa? Okay. So what have you seen in the way of menu innovation that's particularly impressed you? Well, Mariel, I look at menu innovation really in two ways. One is What's, what's just a really smart idea that isn't necessarily totally innovative based on technology or something, but it's just a really good idea. And when you think about that, KFC coming out with their $6 dark meat chicken meal where you get two pieces of, of chicken plus two sides, it's a, it's a great idea. McDonald's puts a Danish in the breakfast lineup, it's affordable. It's, it's one of America's favorite breakfasts. So simple. We're dipping everything. We have Red Robin's new burger coming out with a, a, thing, a bowl of fondue. So you dip your burger. There's a new behavior for us. Dip your burger in the fondue. It's, it's wonderful. And then finally, pizza companies have discovered that, that some people, like more than a quarter of the United States, live alone. And that whole pizza isn't, isn't really the solution all the time. And so they're coming up with different types of options that serve one or with one or two slices or different concoctions. So I think some clever ideas, I guess we should call that. 
but then I think there are culinary superstars for sure. And one of my favorites is the Cheesecake Factory and their ahi pokey nachos. I mean, it is the epitome of fusion at, at, at its best. Krispy Kreme's donut churro hybrid. They are delicious and they're very interesting even just to look at. And then what some chains are doing with just something very basic. Let's take a taco. Velvet Taco, which is out of Texas, has come out with tacos without borders. It's phenomenal. They have paneer tacos. They have Nashville hot tacos. It's like the world is never ending of tacos. And then um, TGA Fridays took fajitas and called them Frijitas. And they have them made with tandoor tandoori chicken and whiskey glazed sirloin. And they've just revamped them into something totally different. And I, and I think that's quite impressive. And lastly, I think it's always fun to look at the fastest growing restaurants in the United States, no matter how small they are. And wonder what, and look at what they're doing, especially on the menu. And the fastest growing restaurant in the United States is serving Brazilian skewers with the sauces and the sides. And it's up like 230% a year. Elizabeth Sloan is a contributing editor at Food Technology and CEO of Sloan Trends, a consulting firm that specializes in consumer, health, food, and culinary trend tracking. As a child growing up in inner city Baltimore, Sarah Bleich was the recipient of federal food assistance benefits. Now, as the Director of Nutrition Security and Health Equity for the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Food and Nutrition Service, Bleich is charged with overseeing and improving those very programs. In this segment, Food Technology's Deputy Managing Editor, Kelly Hensel, talks with Bleich about the nation's efforts to improve health and nutrition and how the science of food community can better contribute to nutrition security and equity. So what are some of the outcomes from the White House conference that leave you feeling optimistic about its potential to bring meaningful change? The most memorable part of the day was definitely the opportunity to connect with folks who have lived experience with the Federal Nutrition Safety Net because their voice is such a critical part of the conversation. And as someone who has lived experience as a child, it was just very important that their perspective was integrated into the conversation. So some critique from attendees was that industry might have been unrepresented at the conference. And obviously, as someone who's going to be involved in, in turning this all into meaningful change, uh, how, does, how do you envision getting food producers and processors like more directly involved? Well, first, I would just make sure listeners are aware that there were more than $8 billion in non-federal commitments to advance the conference goals. So there definitely was a role of industry at the conference. But there's no question that industry has a critical role in our ability to implement the national strategy and to reach the conference goals. So at USDA, for example, we've been actively working with food retailers to promote something called the SNAP Retailer Incentive Waiver, what this does is it allows SNAP authorized stores of which there are more than 240,000 around the country to get approval from the Food Nutrition Service at USDA to offer incentives which encourage SNAP participants to purchase healthier items that are consistent with the dietary guidelines for Americans. So that could be fruits or vegetables or low fat dairy. And this is this waiver is probably one of the easiest and most impactful ways for SNAP authorized retailers to make a commitment that can really promote healthy purchases among SNAP participants. So on kind of turning on to the topic of food as medicine, what are the realistic steps in making nutritious foods and meals a recognized reimbursable healthcare benefit? So pillar two of the national strategy for the White House Conference focuses on integrating nutrition and health, and it aims to prioritize the role of nutrition and food security in overall health, including disease prevention and management to basically ensure that our health system addresses the nutrition needs of all people. So specifically, the national strategy supports creating a pilot to test coverage of medically tailored meals in Medicare. 
And this, these food as medicine interventions, including things like medically tailored meals have been shown to effectively treat or prevent diet related diseases and reduce food insecurity. One of my messages to all of you is that the healthcare sector is already doing amazing things to advance nutrition security, including food as medicine efforts. And we are looking for ways at USDA to really strengthen intersections with the work that's already happening in our suite of more than 15 nutrition assistance programs. But part of what is needed to get more adoption of food as medicine is research to better understand the key components of food as medicine interventions, such as, you know, what is the correct dosage? So how long should someone receive the intervention and how to best transition off? There's a lot of research underway in this space, and it's going to be important to make the case to payers about why this is an important area of investment. So you've said that science, uh, food science is critical to the ability to ensure access to safe, nutritious food. What steps would you most like to see members of the science of food community take to improve food access and affordability? Well, thanks for this question. There is so much that this community, so those of you in the science of food can do to really help improve food access and affordability. I really encourage you all to think about either enhancing an existing White House conference commitment or thinking about making a new one. How are you going to take your existing equities, all the work that you're already doing, and dial it up and do even more in this space? I do also want to encourage you all who are listening to think about joining the USDA MyPlate National Strategic Partners. Current partners include companies and organizations that are national in scope. And they've made a health mandate consistent with the dietary guidelines and the USDA Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion to promote nutrition content in the context of the dietary guidelines. And so what these um, partners are doing is they're disseminating dietary guidelines messages, they're participating in sessions, and they're really helping to make MyPlate a household brand. MyPlate, of course, is the translation of the dietary guidelines in a consumer-friendly format. This community, all of you who are listening, is also so critical in helping us to ensure consistent and equitable access to healthy, safe, affordable foods that are essential to optimal health and well being. So, your efforts to create new and reformulated foods and beverages is fundamental. This work helps us to strengthen the public health impacts of the federal nutrition assistance programs. And then a final area is that each of you can also play a critical role in better integrating diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility principles into the science of food community. This is an important goal of USDA. It's an important goal of this administration. And we welcome you to reach out and share your successes and areas where we might help you to accelerate progress. Obviously, the United States is a prosperous nation. Why do public health and food inequity remain such intractable problems for our society? It's a great question, and it is a big question. So building awareness about the intersections between public health and food inequity is central to my role as the first director of nutrition security and health equity at USDA. A question that we constantly get is how nutrition security differs from our decades long focus at USDA on food insecurity. So for listeners, there are two key distinctions. One, nutrition security recognizes that structural barriers make it hard for many people to live an active, healthy life. And two, our nutrition security efforts emphasize taking an equity lens to all that we're doing. But we can't talk about equity without also thinking about the context in which people live. And that means we have to talk about structural racism. And that is not individual people holding prejudices, but it's rules and laws and practices that are embedded in the economy and societal norms. So longstanding structural racism and policies have increased disease risk and they have reduced opportunities for a healthy life among a number of groups. So as one example, access to quality food is a much larger problem in neighborhoods where the residents are predominantly those with lower incomes or historically underserved populations. And we know that structural racism harms health. It does so in ways that can be described, that can be measured, and that can be dismantled. So if we want to make a difference in this space, we cannot just change individual attitudes. We have to think about transforming policies. This is where our nutrition security work comes in at USDA, and each of you listening today can make a difference. Now, I think we can probably all agree that we are not naive enough to think that USDA alone or folks that are listening can solve these 
giant problems around structural racism in the United States. But we have to be honest enough to look at our policies and ask ourselves, in all the work that we're doing, how can we better promote equity? There is so much opportunity to make a difference since the problems of diet-related diseases and disparities are almost entirely preventable. So my key message to listeners is that we at USDA are leveraging all of our assets to support moves towards healthier eating patterns in an equitable way. And you all, as the science of food community, is fundamental to our ability to do this work. So I encourage you to lean in. We look forward to the work ahead to help ensure that all Americans thrive. Sarah Bleich is the Director of Nutrition Security and Health Equity for the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Food and Nutrition Service. You can read our extended interview with her in the September issue of Food Technology. We'll be back with more Omnivore in a moment. But first, this word from our sponsor. IFT's new concierge membership is available to help your R&D, product development, and innovation teams move faster. Get access to an IFT technical concierge. From curated research to expert connections, you ask, we answer. And all activities are strictly confidential. Learn more about IFT's concierge membership at ift.org slash membership. Welcome back to Omnivore. I'm Bill McDowell. Although supply chain issues throttled plenty of product launches over the past two years, the array of new ingredients and flavors on display at last summer's IFT First annual event and expo suggests the rollout of trendy new food and drink items is about to accelerate. Our editors scoured the expo and found a few surprising twists in health and wellness, sustainability, functionality, and plant-based foods. Food technology editors Emily Little, Julie Larson Brisher, and contributing editor Linda Orr recently sat down to discuss their discoveries on the show floor. All right. I am here with Linda Orr and Julie Britcher, and we're here to talk about some of the food and ingredient trends that we saw at this year's IFT First Annual Show and Expo. So I wanted to start off, Linda and Julie, asking you, this was the first first back since the pandemic. This is the first time we've been in person for two years. How did it feel to be back on the show floor? So for me, I could sense the excitement with attendees as well as the exhibitors. Just the energy and the excitement on the show floor was just contagious. People wanted to be there. They wanted to talk. They wanted to network. And it was exciting. Like, you know, everyone just, it was, it was good to see people. I think I saw a smile on nearly everyone's face. Yes. Yes. <laughs> How about you, Julie? I did too. There was big energy at IFT First this year. And I I, I saw a lot of people that um, I haven't seen for so long, obviously, like everybody else. And um, yeah, I thought the show floor was had a lot of energy, a lot of excitement going on. Absolutely. And this was actually my first time on the show floor. And I really fed off of that energy. And it really helped me uh, start going right ahead eating all of those samples, making sure we got those trends. So the three of us walked the show floor and after lots of notes and lots of talking, we identified five big food trends. And that's what we want to talk about today. So our five trends were holistic health and wellness, clean to clear labels, multifunctional ingredients, sustainable sourcing of your ingredients, and a plant-based power-up. Those were our five trends. And I want to start by asking Linda about multifunctional ingredients. How do these fit into our food products? And specifically, what are they and what do they do? Yeah, so multifunctional ingredients, um, basically, it's kind of what it says. Um, ingredients are flavors that deliver more than one functional property. Um, and what I saw on the show floor regarding this trend is there are ingredients, you know, that have multifunctional properties, but either calling out to attendees, you know, reminding them that they do more than one thing or think outside the box and use these ingredients for other properties that they have. And that all in all addresses, you can use a multifunctional ingredient to address several trends. You can have a multifunctional ingredient that addresses 
trying to lower your formulation costs at the same time as adding a health benefit to a product all in one. For example, let's look at dietary fiber, you know, using dietary fiber for its health benefits, but you know what, reminding people, you can also use it as a sugar reducer. Um, you can use it for texture, mouthfeel, as well as a health property. So there's a lot of properties or benefits that it's adding to a food product. Another one would be whey protein. People use whey protein for the health benefit, the protein enhancement, but you know what, you can also use it as a replacer for egg, um, addressing supply issues, addressing formulation issues, and it also adds texture. And then third, I'll just add also thinking outside the box for ingredients. Um, like MSG was one where, yes, it's a flavor enhancer, but you know what, we saw it in a vanilla ice cream. And not only did it enhance that vanilla note, but it also added a unique savory note to vanilla ice cream that you wouldn't normally associate. So you're creating, you know, these unique end products with multifunctional ingredients. Really getting more bang for your buck, it sounds like. Exactly. Exactly. Great. Let's move over to Julie. Julie, I don't know about you, but I saw so many plant-based things at the show. Everything was plant-based. How do you think this trend is going to keep up? From every survey that I have read, the flexitarian segment of the demographic in consumer surveys is growing exponentially. There were so many innovations in this space. Um, it made it very exciting. And I think a lot of the manufacturers, um, ingredient flavor companies that I visited on the show floor were really geared toward reaching that flexitarian market, which is really growing uh, by leaps and bounds. And it, you could see it on at their booths that the array of sample foods were really exciting. Everything from sort of plant-based uh, sliders, cookies, uh, dairies, drinks, mocktails, uh, you name it. They had ingredients that were replacing, you know, some of those items. Even, even the baked goods, I was a little bit surprised at to see. But um, yeah, I think they have a real challenge. We heard overall the challenge is really remains in that flavor masking arena because taste is king. And if it doesn't taste good, it, I don't care whether you're a flexitarian or not, you're just, you're not going to buy it. Yeah. I heard recently from a colleague that people don't necessarily want a plant-based alternative to taste better. They want it to taste the same. They want that comfort. And I found that that's what people on the show floor were really looking for was how do I make this product taste like what you know and love? Yeah, exactly. And uh, I, I I would also say that it in general, the plant-based trend is also going to be really supported by this overarching goal that so many food and food ingredient companies have, which is to have sustainability um, as an actual real thing at their company and not just greenwashing things, but really making an effort. And that that was the other thing I thought that I I noticed a little bit was this talk about upcycling. And what do you think about that, Em? I saw so many booths talking about upcycled products. And I think this is a really interesting trend of taking byproducts of your of your processes and making it into something new. I saw it mostly within the fruit space. So apple pumice, the one that really caught my eye was at Ocean Spray, their cranberry seeds, which are left over from the juicing process. And they ended up grinding it into this beautiful bright red cranberry flower. And I tasted a couple products. It has all of the antioxidant properties of the cranberry, but it doesn't taste like one. And then it makes your food this beautiful red color. And like I said, using a lot of fruit pumices because those pieces are still there and you want to get as much out of them as you can. So I think a lot more companies are going to be looking at upcycling as a method of waste reduction and truly getting every little nutrient out of that piece of raw material because as prices are going up, as costs are going up, you need to make sure you're getting everything you possibly can. Yeah, not only that, I, I heard from quite a few exhibitors about supply chain issues that are continue to 
cause problems. And so the more options that you have, the more innovative replacer ingredients, or it, whether it's plant-based or not, are going to really help iron out some of those supply chain in- issues for the food processors. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So with the end of our discussion, I am really looking forward to next year's show. And I think you two are as well. So I wanted to ask you, Linda, what are you looking forward to seeing at next year's expo? So I, well, you know, hope that energy and excitement that we saw continues, which I'm sure it it definitely will. Specifically, you know, I am intrigued with how well, one area would be personalized nutrition. There's been a lot of talk of personalized nutrition and seeing how food companies are going to address that, help making the consumer feel like this product was created for me and this is exactly what I was looking for in a, in a product and this is what I wanted it to do and make me feel. And so just seeing how, you know, suppliers as well as manufacturers are going to address that within, you know, the big food industry and seeing how that will play out on the expo floor. And then second would be that fermentation technology. It's just such an exciting area. You know, hints of it were on the show floor this year, just seeing new protein ingredients that were created via fermentation, addressing, again, sustainability, addressing labeling. So I'm excited to see what fermentation, how that will evolve and see where that takes us next year. Julie, how about you? Yeah, I, I'm thinking that for me, I, I, I just think that health and wellness bucket is that's the trend that it, it it touches me personally. And I think a lot of people that I know are we're really looking for food products that help us feel better and operate better, right, in our lives. And so I'm looking for some more innovations in the pre pro and postbiotic space. Um, I think those are that kind of food is medicine, food is health. Uh, I think that's a strong trend that uh, we're going to see for many years to come. But I'm also really looking forward to more flavors with those mocktails. They were awesome. <laughs> there were so many. I know. <laughs> they were all so good. Yes. All using a fruit that I had never heard of, usually a star fruit, passion fruit, just some some fruit you'd never seen at the grocery store. Mm -hmm. That's right. (laughs) It was like a little travel around the world. I mean, that's that's what you can do when you're at at the booze at IFT first, just kind of travel, travel the trends, right? Well, I'm looking forward to seeing more plant-based innovation, specifically in the seafood space. I've been reading a lot with the FAO's research and just different articles saying that we are overfishing and we are really straining our fish population. And so I think that's going to be very big uh, in the next year. I've read that banana blossom can mimic the texture of fish. So I'm really interested to see how companies want to go to try to make seafood more sustainable. We all love our sushi. We all love to have some fish and chips, but we can't just keep fishing and fishing and then there will be none left. Right. Mm -hmm. Also samples, always looking forward to the samples. (laughs) (laughs) And they were good ones. There was like, you know, the seafood addressing that vegan crab meat, I think was one that was, yes, that I was, completely shocked by because it tasted exactly like crab meat. Yeah. Well, Linda, Julie, thank you so much for joining me and talking about our coverage of IFT First. Thank Thank you. you. To see a recap of events and an on-demand library of educational sessions from this year's IFT First, visit iftevent.org. Credit COVID-19 for accelerating the search for better disinfection technologies and methods across the food supply chain. Food engineer Tatiana Kuchma says that urgency has brought about a lot of innovation in food safety technologies. Kuchma has long championed the use of light-based technologies like UV, pulsed light, and LEDs, not only for surface disinfection, but for direct application on foods. 
In a chat with food technology science and technology editor, Julie Larson Brisher, Tatiana details why she thinks ultraviolet light and other light-based technologies are helping to advance food safety from farm to fork. Well, hi, Tatiana. It's great to have you on the Omnivore podcast today. Hey, let's talk a little bit about your recent interview with FT's contributing editor, Jane Caldwell. Uh, in that profile, which was aptly called The Light Fantastic, you talked about how UVC and UV LED technology solve a variety of problems for food processors. What are some of those problem-solving characteristics of these light-based technologies? Thank you very much, Julia, uh, for inviting me uh, again and continue our dialogue that we started in, um, you know, in, in summer. So yes, you know, we continue working with uh, UV light based technology, and we continue uh, uh, exploring different options. You know, and uh, the most efficient option that actually pandemics uh, offered us. And currently, we are working with. Uh, brand new technology, very innovative technology using pulse light in UVC range for uh, disinfecting uh, surfaces and uh, inactivating organisms. And also we will test it for uh, detoxification against mycotoxins. So, uh, and the cool thing about this new pulse light source is that uh, this is polychromatic source that have four different peaks and, um, and the effect of uh, the slides uh, can be synergistic. So uh, this means more effective in activation e- efficacy and to, to provide also, you know, more short treatment. That it's very important when we are talking about, you know, food production. So, yeah, so uh, we conducted first tests in collaboration with an inventor from uh, Los Angeles. And we actually uh, found out that uh, the efficacy of this pulse light source uh, we, we call the pulse electron um, UV lamp. Uh, it's a uh, you know, few times higher compared to the traditional monochromatic uh, sources. And we are very, very excited uh, that um, continue our you know, ex- exploration of these new sources. And we are looking also at not only an activation, but a fundamental mechanism of uh, this um, new source. And we are looking at reactivation and photo reactivation uh, mechanism of cells and how to achieve, you know, the most, the highest efficacy of uh, UV light. And we are very excited about this uh, source right now. Wow, that sounds really good. And, you know, I, I know we've talked before about how your lab and other labs have been doing lots of work in these light based technologies especially with concerns about pathogen control. Um, but um, what what would you say in addition maybe to this new pulse light uh, lamp that you're talking about? Or do you have any more sort of exciting research findings or ones that excite you? You know, first of all, we looked at different wavelengths and we found out that they have different mechanism of actions in terms of bacterial inactivations. And we're also looking at this um, UV LEDs, you know, in terms of their effects or nutrients, or nutrients in uh, different, uh, you know, juices and beverages. And we found out that actually, you know, uh, some vitamins, you know, uh, will be intact if we will use alternative uh, wavelengths. So, you know, uh, we can achieve, you know, similar level of inactivation, but the nutrients, you know, uh, won't be affected. And we uh, actually uh, conducted very interesting research with a uh, you know, is um, coconut water and other beverages. And we look at, um, you know, uh, optimizing the wavelengths that will allow us, you know, to use UV light. But at the same time, you know, uh, uh, the nutrient, uh, nutritional quality of, uh, you know, of the product won't be affected. And this actually, you know, uh, using this alternative wavelengths, uh, I think this is, uh, you know, this will, allow, this will allow us to achieve this goal. So we are not only looking at bacterial inactivation, but also, you know, on improving the quality of, uh, you know, of foods and beverages. And I think, you know, in the nearest future, this can become, you know, possible. 
That's amazing because it wasn't that long ago that I think people and even scientists that I know thought of, especially UVC and other sort of light-based technologies as potentially harmful to the humans. And and so you didn't use it very frequently. But actually, you know, right now there is a new development um, in, uh, you know, in lab technologies that, uh, and this new development is uh, uh, about using uh, shorter wavelengths in UVC range in this bactericidal range that is like you know around 222 nanometers, and it was found that you know this light, uh, you know this uh, light that is much shorter than traditional 254 nanometers light, is safe for people. So it doesn't, uh, you know, um, cause undesirable uh, effects on the eyes or, or on the skin and so on. And there is a lot of interesting research yet, you know, um, using 222 nanometers. And we're also looking at this, you know, because, uh, you know, for using its uh, safe attributes and uh, this attributes, safe attributes for humans. So I think this is very interesting, uh, another very interesting uh, development in UV C technologies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's really exciting. Now, I also, I have heard here that you are now working on a project using UVC LED light system to disinfect water. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Oh, yeah. This is new and very exciting uh, project that we just started and, and just like, you know, in the very, very beginning. And actually, you know, uh, the reason to start this project, because, you know, uh, I am half Ukrainian, half uh, Russian, and uh, this war in um, in uh, Ukraine, right, it's very personal for me. And I always wanted to uh, assist, you know, uh, Ukrainian scientists and, uh, you know, uh, to overcome all these difficulties and so on. And, uh, you know, I collaborated with Ukrainian uh, scientist, Maxim Bajal, and we wrote an article about uh, great potential of, uh, you know, food science and food technology in Ukraine. And um, we discussed Ukraine as a grain and food hub. uh, hub. So after we published this uh, article in Open Access Journal and Frontiers, so the U.S. company Crystal S uh, reached out to me and said, okay, you know, we know you work in the UVC area and the respective work and so on. And we want to donate uh, uh, you and your collaborator, you know, five UVC uh, LED systems and uh, in order to use them for uh, cleaning water in Ukraine. So right now we are looking for uh, companies uh, to sponsor this research, research, this project. And also, uh, you know, we applied to IFT for funding to conduct validation studies and maybe, you know, to collaborate with the university in Kiev and uh, to conduct this study. I think this can be very exciting, you know, uh, uh, study that shows uh, how novel technologies uh, like LED uh, UV system that are small, portable and very flexible, you know, can be applied in the time of crisis. Wow, that's really exciting. Thank you very much, Tatiana, for the updates. It's always a pleasure chatting with you. You're very, very welcome. Tatiana Kuchma leads research in novel processing and food safety engineering for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada's Gelf Research and Development Center. She is currently chair of IFT's non-thermal processing division. You can read our profile, The Light Fantastic, featuring Tatiana's insights into light-based technologies in the September issue of Food Technology. Thank you to this episode's sponsor, IFT's new concierge membership. Accelerate your product development and innovate faster with a concierge membership. Find out more at www.ift.org membership. And that wraps up this episode of Omnivore. Thanks again to all of our guests and my colleagues at Food Technology. Omnivore is produced and distributed by the Institute of Food Technologists. If you enjoyed today's show and want to learn more about Food Technology Magazine or how to join the conversation by becoming an IFT member, visit ift.org slash membership. For more in-depth discussions about innovation in the science of food, 
Check out IFT's other podcast, SciDish, on the news and publications page of IFT.org. If you have comments or suggestions for future shows, just send us an email. The address is editors at IFT.org. For the entire team at Food Technology and IFT, I'm Bill McDowell. Thanks for listening and join us again for our next episode. This is Omnivore.